Hello everyone, my name is Kevin. I am the strength and conditioning coach and sport nutritionist at the Canadian Sport Institute Ontario that works with Canoe Kayak Ontario. Today I'm going to be covering strength training and recovery. So on the agenda, I will first cover some of uh, the anatomy and physiology as a bit of a refresher, just to get our uh, heads in the right space. I'll then talk about uh, different types of strength. We'll talk about the application within your sport. I'll talk about some practical considerations during this pandemic, and then we'll talk about some nutritional considerations at the end as well that will help us optimize everything that we're doing. So to start, we'll cover some of the anatomy and the physiology. So this is a muscle fiber and uh, we have our thin actin filaments and we have our thick myosin filaments and uh, this is called the sliding filament theory. And the way this works is that these thick uh, filaments here have these little arms and they grab onto the thin filaments and then they pull them towards that M line a look at this bottom image here and then what happens with the uh, muscle is it gets shorter so sliding filament theory the uh, the thick filaments pull the thin filaments uh, towards the center and the muscle gets shorter so the muscle pulls it then pulls on this tendon here and assuming the tendon is strong enough uh, it will transfer that force and then it will move that bone and this is how we create movement so again, our muscles contract, they pull on tendons, the tendons pull on bones, and we create movement. Here we have an mTOR complex. I know it looks complicated, but I'll simplify it a little bit for you. Uh, this is going to be a key piece in terms of us training the muscle, or how do we create adaptation, in this case that strength adaptation that we're looking for. Uh, this is going to be one of those key pieces within the cell, so from a cell signaling perspective. And so one of the big things that we do is that we, if we want to get stronger, then we strength train. And strength training gives us some mechanical loading of these muscles. And that stimulates a molecule called AKT. And then that downstream activates mTOR, which then leads us to a strength adaptation. A few other things I'm going to key in on here. Uh, you don't need to have an understanding of every single stage of this. Uh, but just some things to keep in mind that I'll try to loop in later on in the presentation. Insulin also plays a role in this AKT molecule, so it'll also give us that, uh, that um, mTOR stimulus signaling, which will then give us a strength adaptation. And, of course, how do we get an insulin response? That comes from carbohydrates and calories. And then down here at the bottom, the other thing to consider is our amino acids and our proteins. So arginine and leucine are two different amino acids. And so we need amino acids and protein to, again, stimulate mTOR, and then that gives us a strength adaptation. So carbs and protein, good for getting strong. Another thing here to consider is a molecule called AMPK. And AMPK is an energy sensing molecule within the cells, and it actually works in balance with mTOR. So when AMPK is high, it is going to blunt our mTOR signaling. AMPK is usually high when we have energy stress. So whether we're training a lot, or we've trained very recently for an extended period of time, or if we're not eating enough. So AMPK will will activate when we have uh, energy stress and then that will blunt our mTOR signaling. So one of the key takeaways from this, knowing that these two are always working in balance, is that you want to give yourself some time before you do your strength training. Don't do a long exhausting conditioning session and then right after follow that with your strength training. It's going to be hard to get strong if that's the case you want to give yourself a break in the literature is saying about three to six hours in between your strength training sessions and uh, any other type of training that you're doing is going to be optimal. So again, from a cell signaling physiology perspective, you want to give yourself a break between your sessions if you want to get the most out of your session. Okay, so there's that little quick physiology refresher. 
Now I'm going to introduce the different types of strength. So strength in general is the ability of a muscle or a group of muscles to generate force, and that's the ability to do work. And we have three types of strength. We have maximal strength, and this is the ability to produce a max voluntary contraction or produce maximum force. How much force that we can produce is going to be dictated by our maximum strength. We also have strength endurance, and this is more of the ability to maintain force production over a long period of time. And then we also have our speed strength aspect, and that is the ability to do work as quickly as possible. And so really, these are three different types of strength, and they are going to be dictated in our programming by three different variables. And these are important variables to understand and to be in control of when we're programming if we want to get the type of strength adaptation we're looking for. So max strength is going to be dictated by the load. Right? Lift something heavier, you get stronger. Strength endurance is going to be dictated by our volume or the time that we do something. And speed strength is going to be dictated by velocity. So these are three key acute variables that we're going to play around with in our programming. And that's going to tell us what type of strength we're stimulating, and what type of strength adaptation we are going to get. So an easy way to look at this is in a triangle like this. So this is our speed, strength, endurance triangle. And so up at the top, we have speed. On the right here, we have endurance. And on the left, we have our, uh, sometimes we just call that strength, but really it's referring to maximum strength here. And the nice thing about looking at it like this is it also gives us three spectrums that we can look at because the reality is that an exercise is not just velocity or it's not just load or it's not just volume. It's always a combination of all three. So we can look at these as a spectrum that gives us a bit more of a nuanced look. And so then we have our speed endurance spectrum. We have our strength endurance spectrum. This is also the spectrum that's going to give us our hypertrophy adaptations. That's important to keep in mind. And then we have our speed strength spectrum, and that's also sometimes called our power spectrum. It's probably also important to note here that this spectrum here, our speed endurance spectrum, this is probably the spectrum you're doing uh, most of your on-water training uh, along, and this is going to correlate somewhat with those training zones that, uh, that you have, and if you're thinking about your linear or undulating periodization models um, in terms of NCCP or whatever you're doing here, uh, they're probably going to be working uh, for the most part along this speed endurance spectrum. Okay, so now that we know the types of strength and the different spectrums that we're working in, uh, let's take a look at how we actually start to train some of these different types of strength. And so if you look at from left to right here, this is a scale in terms of the number of reps that we would do. And reps 1 to 5 are going to be good for strength and power. We'll talk about how you... Uh, how you get one versus the other in a moment. And then as you start to creep over around six reps or so, you're going to start to get into more of that hypertrophy zone. And then as you start to progress past around 10 to 12 reps, you're going to be starting to work more on that muscular endurance end of things. It's also important to note here that uh, the volume intensity re relationship is critical. Uh, just because you start to do less reps doesn't automatically make it power or strength training. Uh, and like the way I like to think about it is uh, doing three push-ups when you can do 50 doesn't make it max strength training. It has to get more difficult. So when we're talking about uh, one to five reps for strength training, that is assuming that the intensity is adequate, that they are working just as hard at one to five reps. So it's always about that intensity volume relationship. If you just do less work, that's not going to make you strong. And just to wrap up uh, the last couple acute variables that you're going to need to be aware of when you're programming, sets, you're probably um, asking athletes to do anywhere from two to six sets of any of these exercises. That's going to partly depend on uh, logistics, how much time you have, how fit the athlete is, how much of an emphasis you want to put on uh, these 
strength training um, attributes, knowing that that's going to eat up some energy and time that you could be allocating to something else. So uh, there's there's no right or wrong here. Use your coaching judgment, but it's probably going to be anywhere from two to six or so sets. Um, you know, if you really want to get into strength or power training, you, you might start getting above six sets, but that's that ends up being quite a bit, uh, quite a bit of volume uh, that you're doing then for for something that it, that is supposed to be more based on velocity or or load. The other variable would be your rest intervals, and uh, that is going to depend on the type of training that you're doing. Uh, if you're looking for more of that um, that endurance or hypertrophy type of adaptation, so you're you're working along that um, that that strength endurance spectrum, but closer to the endurance end, uh, you want them to get fatigued. So you don't want to give them too much rest between sets, or uh, you just have to do more work to get fatigued again. So uh, less rest there as you approach max strength. Uh, you can see up at the top two to five minutes. Uh, there so you probably want to be increasing the time a little bit and then as you really work along that uh, speed strength spectrum into your power work uh, you want to be giving more time the actual specific time you're going to pick whether it's 30 seconds or one minute or, or 90 seconds or whatever you pick that that will again depend on a number of variables how much time you have to do the workout uh, how heavy are you asking them to lift or how explosive are you asking them to lift um, with how much volume so how fatigued are they getting uh, and how much time do they need to recover uh, from that remember when you're working strength and power it's not about getting them tired it's about lifting something heavy or lifting something fast having said that if you have an athlete that needs five minutes between every set because they are um, because they're just uh, so crushed from that it may be worth going back to doing some more hypertrophy, muscular endurance training, building up a bit of a better base so that they have the ability to uh, do strength and power training with a bit of volume and still get through it without getting crushed. Also think back to uh, your energy systems, what Mel was talking about, that aerobic system provides a lot of um a, a foundation or a base even for our strength training so the the better our aerobic system is the uh, the better we will recover during these rest periods or you're gonna you're gonna be able to utilize the oxygen you're breathing in you're gonna have better circulation you're gonna deliver nutrients remove waste all that kind of stuff so the the fit the the aerobically fitter your athlete is the better they will be able to deal with short recovery periods so Again, if you have an athlete that just needs these really long rest periods before they're recovered, it might be worth going back to some of the basics and then try to get back to your strength power training down the road. So back to our triangle here, our different types of strength. Uh, the way I would approach this if I was doing uh, some strength training or trying to create a strength training program, I would look at uh, the speed endurance spectrum and I would think that's probably for the most part being taken care of on water training. It's probably not the best use of my time if I'm developing a strength training program to address that there. So I'd probably chalk that up to the on water training and then I would focus my strength training on this side of the triangle. So uh, I would look at my hypertrophy, my strength and my power types of exercises. And then I would create some kind of periodized strength training program. The easiest way to look at it is that linear model. Uh, it's not to say that that's better than an undulating model, but it's, uh, it's probably the easiest way to start looking at it. And part one, I'd probably start with the hypertrophy, similar to how we are on water training. You probably don't want to jump right into speed. You want to do some base, some endurance first. You probably want to work along that strength endurance spectrum. So start with your hypertrophy training. Uh, and the way I like to think about that is part one or step one is building the muscle. And then I move into part two. And again, this could be linear. This could be a month later. This could be a couple months later. Or this could be a little bit more of a complex undulating type of model. But eventually I would merge work into part two which is max strength or I would learn to use the muscle so I build the muscle and then I want to learn to use it I want to learn to produce as much force as possible with that muscle 
and then maybe leading into a peak or down the road or again this is a concurrent training where we're putting this all together at the same time but at some point I also want to be training my power so that's part three and then that would be uh, build the muscle learn to use the muscle and then learn to use the muscle quickly so it's going to be now about rate of force production not just max force so build the muscle learn to use it and then learn to use it quickly At this point, it's important to remember that uh, all of these adaptations and, and these types of strength we're talking about, they're, they're muscle and, and movement specific. Um, so there are central adaptations that occur, but uh, um, there's also a lot of localized adaptation. So you train a lot of legs, it doesn't mean your arms are going to get strong. Uh, because of this, we need to start to create some categories. So the um, the way I would break this up is um, I, I would look at dynamic needs and, and static needs. And dynamic needs are going to be those needs where we need all, all three types of strength uh, to create that movement we were talking about earlier. Static needs are going to be more along just that strength endurance spectrum and they're going to be required to hold uh, position. So still important but, but not actually moving, so a little less... Uh, important along that um, power spectrum of moving things quickly. It's more just resisting forces and holding positions. So dynamic needs and static needs. It's also important to remember um, there's a lot of different ways that you can break this up and you can do this correctly. There's also a lot of ways to do it wrong. I'm going to show you one way to do it, um, but keeping in mind that you're the expert there might actually be a better way to do this. Um, but for argument's sake, let's say that the way I break it up is the correct way. Um, and then we can talk about the implications of that. So I would say our dynamic needs for your sport. Um, there's going to be a push need, a pull need, uh, and then probably a core rotational need. So these are all different types of movements that are actually required uh, for your sport for performance or health or if you want to look on the beach or, or whatever whatever we're trying to accomplish here. And then from the static side of things, I would say that uh, the lower body posterior chain, so those lower body, lower back, glutes, hamstrings, uh, and then those the quads, um, legs, quads, those are going to be important muscles, but a little bit more static. Now you are generating force, but it's mostly force that you're generating and then transferring through your core and to your arms because your arms are at the end of the day uh, uh, what move us. So again, a little bit more of a static need. I would say it's probably valuable to train uh, these again in, in not necessarily muscle or movement specific, well muscle specific, but not necessarily movement specific, but position specific here. So uh, training kayakers in a kayak position, so in that hip hinge type position, and training uh, canoe in a in more of a lunge split stance type of position. So this may be uh, you know doing more leg press or squats and deadlifts with kayakers, and maybe doing more lunges with uh, with our canoers. So that's a nice way to, to break everything up, but then obviously uh, uh, in our current climate during uh, COVID-19, during this pandemic, it adds some extra problems. So let's problem solve, let's troubleshoot some of the things that we're facing uh, currently when we're trying to implement our strength training programs. It may be actually hard to train certain muscles or movements, so I know I said that I would focus on push-pull core rotation and then some static development of the lower body, but the reality is that uh, it might be hard to do some of those things. That's a potential problem. It might also be hard to train certain types of strength, uh, and this is probably going to vary from athlete to athlete, different uh, environments, different access to facilities and equipment. And so that's potentially also a problem is that maybe we can train certain types of strength, but not others. So what do we do about it? I'll probably start with saying that it's important to be innovative and to think outside the box here. Now that's easy to say, um, 
the reality is sometimes we just won't be able to do certain things, but at least give it some thought and uh, and and try to problem solve, try to to come up with something that would work. Um, again, y you may not be able to, so work on what you can and don't sweat what you can. If you do find you're in a situation where you or your athletes can train certain types of strength or certain muscles or movements, but not others. Uh, identify the gaps. So again, go back to your program and what your priorities are and identify the gaps and what you're not training because what that lets you do is address those gaps when you do get an opportunity. Uh, being aware of the gaps is uh, in a better position than actually having no idea that it's a gap at all. So even if you can't do anything about it, identify them so that you can address them down the road. So now that we have an idea of the physiology and the anatomy, uh, types of strength, different movements that are going to be important, uh, and what we want to do about it, how do we train these different types of strength, all of that kind of stuff, what I'm going to do now is give you a bit of a grab bag of different exercises that fall into some of these different categories of types of strength and movements uh, that are potential options during a quarantine or during our kind of limited access to facilities. Now the reality is as we move through this, there are still going to be certain exercises that are or are not possible um, for every different athletes in different environments and situations. Uh, so hopefully this is just to kind of get you thinking or it's a bit of a resource for you to go back to, uh, but it's not to say that this is a complete program and that's going to work for everybody. So let's start with our hypertrophy type of exercises and then focusing on that push movement again. And so when we're thinking about hypertrophy, we're thinking about six plus reps, so minimum six reps or more. And again, I probably wouldn't venture too high, knowing that when you do get on the water, you're going to be doing a lot of that endurance training already. So that's probably going to be taken care of. So I'd probably focus on not going too high, but over six reps if I want to get hypertrophy. Uh, if we're thinking time under tension or if you're going to do some static or holds, that might be more like uh, at least 15 seconds. Of exercise and then again we need to work to near failure so whatever you pick um, the intensity has to correspond with that push-ups are always a good option you also have a little bit of play with intensity uh, when you do push-ups you can move from your knees which is kind of like an incline um, it changes the angle it also shortens that lever or actually just doing a true incline push-up or a decline push-up an incline push-up would be something like maybe you put their hands on a couch or a chair or a table that makes it a little bit easier so again if you have that athlete that's not quite strong enough to do six at least six reps uh, with good form and you but you want to be working hypertrophy you need to get the volume up there if you put them on an incline it makes it just easy enough they might be able to do a little bit more volume and then you're going to get that hypertrophy adaptation the other thing is if you have that athlete that can rip off 50 push-ups at a time and you really want to work hypertrophy though and not uh, more of that strength endurance kind of end of the spectrum, then uh, putting their feet up, elevating their feet, that makes it a little bit more difficult. So you might be able to get those uh, reps uh, counts down. Push-up holds work as well. Band presses are good. If you can find a place to anchor, you can do overhead presses with a band. Um, if you have those power bands that are a complete loop, you wrap it around their foot, they can press overhead. But you can press at various angles too, especially if you have an anchor point, whether you wrap it around a sturdy uh, post or, or table leg if it's heavy enough. Uh, or you can get those uh, door anchors where you put them through um, a crack in the door and then it locks it in. As long as the door is sturdy enough, you're not going to pull the door off the frame. Uh, then that gives you a lot of options there. And you can get different uh, different thickness bands to make it easier or harder. You can also move closer or further to get that desired load and reference. So again, it's always about balancing uh, the intensity and the volume here. If you've got a bit of a stronger athlete, you can get into your handstand presses and or holds. A lot of athletes are going to need to rest their heels on the wall for balance. That's okay. I mean, maybe you want to work on if you're thinking about uh, developing upper body uh, coordination and balance and that kind of stuff. Um, maybe get their feet off. But if we're just looking to get a hypertrophy adaptation, there's nothing wrong with getting them to rest their heels just uh, so that they don't fall over. And then again, keeping in mind that you, uh, you need to probably be in your holds or time under tension uh, for at least 15 seconds. Uh, if you want to get that hypertrophy adaptation, then you want to be working to near failure. 
doing a one minute handstand hold is uh, actually pretty difficult. And again, if you can get a hold of something heavy, you can always do some overhead presses as well. So that could be like a school bag with a bunch of textbooks in it. Again, uh, it's all about balancing that intensity load and it's gonna be different for every athlete based on their base strength. Um, but if you can get something that's heavy enough, you can load up a bag and get them to do a whole bunch of reps and pressing it over their head, that's also a good pushing option. All right, max strength push options now. So we're working that one to five rep range or one, one to 15 seconds if you're thinking time under tension again, and uh, of course working to near failure. Uh, so it's not just about doing less reps, it's about a, doing less reps because it's heavier, because it's harder, that's gonna help us because you have to do more force, uh, give us that max strength type of adaptation. So thinking about our push-ups again, some athletes, push-ups is going to be a max strength type of workout. And again, you play around a little bit with the incline, decline uh, to get the desired load and reps. But the reality is that sometimes you, you just can't vary it enough. Some people push-ups are max strength and some people push-ups are hypertrophy and some people push-ups are endurance. And uh, you can only vary it so much, but it's an option for some people. Same thing with our band presses. Uh, you can press at different angles, uh, depending on the different thickness bands. You can get pretty stiff, thick bands that can become quite difficult to press. Um, and then you can move further closer to the anchor point. But again, sometimes it's just very hard to actually vary that uh, load enough to get max strength. And definitely if they're working with those therapy bands, it's probably not going to be uh, stiff enough to to be a max strength exercise. So it can be difficult there, but sometimes you can find some options. I would avoid the handstand presses or holds uh, when you're thinking about max strength. If somebody can't hold that position for at least 15 seconds, it's gonna be a little dangerous. They're not gonna be very stable. And if you think about a handstand hold, uh, what happens if their arms give out? They're gonna land on their head, might give themselves a concussion, hurt their neck, something like that. So it's probably not safe to, uh, to train uh, handstand presses and holds and things like that for max strength. So be careful with that. In theory, you could, if you have somebody whose body weight is heavy enough that um, that holding or pressing in that position is is um, difficult, they can only do it for maybe 10 seconds or, or three, four reps, which for a lot of people, that's probably the case. In theory, that's max strength training, but I would be careful again. It's kind of dangerous. And again, if you can get a heavy enough bag or, or something that they can press over their head, maybe a coffee table or something, if they're not worried about dropping it and it's, uh, and it's heavy enough, um, you could train max strength. But again, uh, you only have so many options. So for a strong athlete, it's going to be hard to find something heavy enough for them to train max strength uh, with overhead presses. So what do we do then? Let's say you're in this situation and you go through that checklist and say, oh, push-ups aren't an option, band presses aren't an option, handstands aren't an option, overhead presses are not an option. What do you do? Uh, and Mel alluded to this in her session uh, a little while back. This is where we could get into some of our isometric training. And so I want to spend a moment here talking about this. Uh, isometrics is uh, an exercise. It's when there's no movement. And specifically here, we can look at some of our maximum uh, effort isometric training. And that could be, for example, you're doing a push-up and um, you wrap a towel around your back so that when you're in the bottom position, you grab it, you make it nice and tight, and then you push, but the towel, the tension of the towel stops you from uh, completing the rep. And then that lets you push as hard as you can. Um, you can also do this if you have a bunch of, of um, big, stiff, heavy, thick, um, bands, those power bands, you can overload it so you know you're not going to be able to finish that rep and then you just push as hard as you can into the band. So that's the key here is you need to push as hard as you can. You need to generate as much force as possible. Sometimes we call these overcoming isometrics. The idea that we try to overcome uh, the, uh, the resistance but you can't. And this would this is versus uh, something else called a yielding isometric. So isometrics get confusing. We, we throw out the term a lot, but uh, a yielding isometric would be more like that push-up hold where you, you go to the bottom of the push-up or even at the top like a plank um, 
and you hold the position, but you're choosing to stay there. You could move if you wanted to, but you're choosing to stay there. And then you'll stay there for a period of time. Those can be great if you think back to the hypertrophy. It's great for accumulating volume um, at a given load. So it can still be good for hypertrophy and endurance. But if you're not pushing as hard as you can, it's not going to be the best for developing uh, developing max strength. If you think about it again, uh, you know, if you can do a ton of push-ups, it's not you're not going to push as hard as you can on any given push-up. It's going to be hard to develop max strength. Again, if you don't have any big bands, it's going to be hard to develop max strength. Avoiding the handstands because you don't want to hurt yourself. Um, if you don't have anything heavy to press over your head, it's going to be hard to develop max strength. So that's where our, our max isometrics come in. And so whether that's push-ups uh, or doing your band presses where you, you just anchor a whole bunch of really heavy bands or maybe a towel somewhere and you just try to push with, uh, against it as hard as you can but you can't move, it gives you that opportunity to, to generate your maximum amount, amount of force and that's going to help us uh, get a strength adaptation. So th this is a nice tool or a nice trick for us to do during quarantine when we don't have access necessarily to, to heavy barbells or dumbbells or, or our more traditional uh, ways of forcing us to produce as much um, uh, force as possible. The thing about isometrics is that they they are the adaptation is going to be joint angle specific because we aren't moving through a range. You're not going to get strong through a range. You will get uh, stronger at that position that you're training where you were trying to push and move it but because it's an immovable object it doesn't move by definition you're not going to get strong through that full range so uh, it begs the question where do you do the isometrics what joint angles what positions do you do do you do them in as many as possible maybe but you'll drive yourself crazy trying to replicate every single position of a movement and then train an isometric there and it's probably not logistically possible so generally the idea would be we want to train at something called a sticking point. And a sticking point is the point of a movement where we have the least mechanical advantage. Uh, and so if we take a look at the screen here, a bicep curl is, is probably the easiest way to wrap our heads around this, um, although it does apply to more complex movements too. It doesn't just need to be a bicep curl. And so if you think about the arm here, the forearm is going to be this moment arm and it's going to uh, move around the pivot, which is an elbow or the fulcrum here. And you're going to be holding weight in that hand. So that's going to be where the load is. And the relative difficulty of the exercise is going to be proportional to how far horizontally that load gets from the, uh, from the elbow. In the case of bicep curl, that's going to be when it's uh, completely horizontal or it's going to be about halfway through the movement. You've probably felt this before if you do resistance uh, exercises, resistance training, lifting weights. There's usually a point in the movement that's the most difficult. It's relatively the hardest because the load that you're moving, the, the uh, whether it's you in the boat and you're trying to move the water or you're trying to move your body up in a push-up from the ground against gravity or you're trying to push a, a barbell or a dumbbell, there's usually a point in the movement that's the most difficult. Even though the load is the same, the weight doesn't change throughout, it, it's the, uh, the change in the the mechanical advantage at different joint angles that's going to make something easier or harder. We want to train at these sticking points because if we're going to miss a rep, if we're going to not be strong enough at any point through a movement, it's going to be at these uh, quote unquote sticking points. So you want to find these movements. Where is the movement most difficult? And then that's going to be where you want to train your isometrics. Okay, and so then our last category, we've, uh, we've built the muscle, we've uh, learned how to use it, maybe with some isometrics, especially we're trying to learn how to use it at, uh, at our sticking points where we're, um, we're going to be relatively the weakest. And then the ne next step or the last step would be to uh, learn to use it quickly, learn to produce that force quickly. Again, this is that one to five reps, but instead of working to near failure, it's now not that relationship between load and volume, it's that relationship between load and velocity. So you want to pick the weight that is the most difficult, but where you can still move it through that concentric phase or that up phase explosively. So you don't want it to be so heavy that you are 
moving through slowly or you're seeing someone grind through a rep. That's not being powerful. You want to move um, explosively or quickly with some velocity, but you still want it to be as heavy as possible. So it's that relationship between load and velocity. You don't want to go too light. If you go too light, you're really just training speed again. And we already kind of take care of speed on the water, so it's probably not the best use of our time in the gym. Uh, you, we, we want to go as heavy, move something as heavy as possible, as quickly as possible. So that's what power is. And so this case, uh, thinking back to our push-ups or our pushing exercises, explosive push-ups, uh, maybe explosive kneeling push-ups or explosive incline or decline push-ups. Again, playing around with that load, that relative difficulty, to get it to the point where you can uh, do it explosively for anywhere between one to five reps. Uh, just a note with these explosive push-ups, don't clap. Um, I'm not a big fan of clapping. I find that it takes away from the intent to actually push the ground away from you or for them push into the ground as hard as possible. They start thinking about how to pull their hands early and get as much air time, and then they might catch themselves in a pretty low um, elbow flexed position. It, and then they try, try to keep their hands in the air as long as possible. It, and that's kind of the same, but it's not exactly the same as pushing as explosively, as fast, and as hard as they can into the ground. So try to cue them to just push push into the ground as hard as possible, push the ground away from you, um, push yourself into the air, explode. Those are the types of cues you want to use, opposed to trying to get them to think about clapping. You'll get people that try to do a whole bunch of claps and then they land on their face and hurt themselves. And at the end of the day, they weren't actually being uh, powerful or explosive. So a couple different options I like to use, and these are all uh, various um, versions that are all going to train power but just slightly differently um, so you can do a, a kind of a classic push-up where you just go down and up but you go down and then you try to explode up and the idea would be to actually leave the ground right push the ground away from you leave the ground get as much air time as you can uh, but by pushing into the ground so you just go down and explode up you can also move up and down the spectrum a little bit this power spectrum by adding a little bit more volume um, decreasing the velocity a little bit and then forcing it to, to get the velocity going again. So you could go down and introduce a pause. So down, pause, one second, two seconds, three seconds, however long you want, but then also explode up. Sometimes this is uh, this is called uh, power endurance. So it's the idea that you're, you're playing around with all three variables. So instead of moving up and down one of these spectrums, you're kind of moving uh, the stimulus right into the middle of that triangle. Uh, so down, pause, explode up. So that's a good way to train, but as long as you're being explosive, if, if they start moving really slow, you're probably pausing too long. Uh, but down, pause up, or you could also do it where they uh, there's no reactive part at the bottom at all. You just start at the bottom, they start laying on their chest, they put their hands on the ground, and then you get to explode up uh, right from uh, no movement at all. So all various ways of training power with that explosive push-up. You also do explosive stuff with the band presses. Again, if you can anchor it at the wall, um, you can press at different angles, move further back depending on uh, how difficult you want it, uh, use different thickness bands. And then in this case, you're probably going to actually try to introduce your hips a little bit, rotate the hips, and then explode through that movement. It's going to teach them to generate some force from their hips, transfer it through their core, and then into that pushing movement again. It should be very similar to what you, uh, what you probably are asking them to do on the water. A slightly different movement, but conceptually of producing uh, force from their uh, their core and their big muscles and transferring it through their arms to something. Okay, so let's move into hypertrophy for our pulling options. Again, I'm going to move through this a little quicker this time. Um, not going to explain everyone uh, every single time, it's, so it's more of just a grab bag. I'm going to try to use the terms that were you, if you just wanted to Google it, if you weren't sure what it is, uh, or YouTube it, um, pretty standard terminology. Uh, for these exercises, I'm going to throw them all just to give you a bit of an option. You, you can, again, start to be innovative, think outside the box, figure out what your options are. Um, for some of these. So hypertrophy, this is our six plus reps to near failure or 15 plus seconds, but for our pulling options now. So our body row and or holds and trying to be innovative again, this might be you're laying under the dinner table and you reach up and you grab onto the edge of the dinner table and then you pull towards your chest or maybe you pull and you hold at the top or maybe you do both, you pull, hold, back down, maybe you pause for three seconds. Um, 
and then you know you were thinking about with a, a number of reps to near failure or uh, holds and time to near failure uh, that would be a good way to get some hypertrophy with those pulling movements and those uh, uh those posterior back muscles and things like that the problem is it's hard to vary right you're kind of stuck with what you got your body is either heavy enough um or light enough, depending on how you think about it, to get hypertrophy adaptation um, if you do enough volume, or it's not. It's hard to load. You could think about putting heavier things. Maybe you got like a bag with some textbooks. Again, you put that on your chest, uh, put put something heavy on your chest, uh, but you can only do so much. So sometimes it's hard to get the, the load in the sweet spot there. Chin-ups and pull-ups, if you have something to hold on to, they can be great. These are often too difficult. P Chin-ups, it's amazing how hard chin-ups and pull-ups are to do true chin-ups and pull-ups properly with good form. Um, it can be very difficult. So a lot of our athletes just aren't going to be strong enough to be doing enough volume to get hypertrophy. Could be a great strength, uh, max strength exercise, but often too difficult. But if you have that nice strong athlete, pull-ups, chin-ups, those are great exercises uh, for building some muscle. And then you can do your band pulls, just like your pushes. If you can find a place to anchor it, you can pull at various... Uh, angles um, you can move closer or further to make it more difficult use thicker uh, or thinner bands all that kind of stuff maybe you double up a whole bunch of bands uh, there find it's usually easier to do staggered or a kneeling stance um, just for stability often uh, you need to do these single arms too if you try to do these both arms at a time with a strong athlete what they're going to end up doing is uh, they won't be able to actually hold their body in place. They'll just end up pulling themselves close to the band, closer to the band. Um, so by using one arm, you're relatively not as strong compared to your body weight. Uh, so it makes it easier to stay in place. Um, so again, those strong athletes, uh, if you get to use both hands on one band, they're just going to be too strong and they won't actually be able to do the exercise properly. And also band pull apart. So those are nice things that you can do. If you can find, um, find a band, uh, put it out in front of your chest, arms straight, and then just uh, 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 pull the band apart as hard as you can. So max strength options. Again, sometimes it's an option, sometimes it's not. Uh, we're working that 1 to 5 rep range, uh, 1 to 15 seconds to near failure. Body row. For some people, it's going to be strength. For some people, it's not. Um, again, hard to vary the, the load. So, um, you know, different for every athlete, but for some of them... Uh, their body is going to weigh enough that they can only do a few reps. It's good max strength training for them. Again, same thing with chin-ups and pull-ups, but kind of the opposite. You're going to find a lot of athletes are not um, are not strong enough to do chin-ups and pull-ups for hypertrophy training, but they are. But it is the perfect amount for max strength training because they can only do three or four good reps on these. Uh, if that's the case, great way to get strong. Band pulls, again, if you can play around with the angles and the thickness and, and distance from the anchor point, uh, you might be able to do some band pulls uh, for strength training. And then you can also introduce some of those isometric ideas, so max isometric or overloaded band pulls. Um, again, single arm or unilateral probably works best. If you're trying to get someone to pull as hard as they can on a towel or a, a band that's too thick for them to, to actually stretch out, if you do it two hands at a time, they'll probably just end up pulling themselves closer to the band instead. So you need to uh, you need to get them in a nice stable position, and then you probably need to pull one arm at a time just so that their body weight is heavy enough. Most people are not able to do a single arm chin up or pull up, so their body is heavy enough that if they pull on that band, they're not going to just pull themselves towards the the band or the towel instead. And then again, you can do uh, band pull aparts if you have a heavy enough band. And also thinking about our isometric options for potentially band pull-aparts or towel pull-aparts in this case as well. That might be a good way to do it. Towel pull-aparts, almost anyone can do, right? You, uh, you go grab a towel, a shirt, a sweater. Don't grab a thin shirt, something that you know they're not going to pull, pull apart. And just get them to hold their arms out in front and they pull as hard as they can. It's something. Again, it's going to be uh, joint angle specific. It's not going to be um, necessarily in that sticking point because you can only vary the distance so much. But... Um, it's something and at least you're getting them to do max force production. So if you have nothing else to do for your, uh, for your back and your pulling options for max strength, you can at least do a max isometric towel pull. 
And then power, again, so one to five reps, but with a, an explosive concentric phase. So this is where if you do have that really strong athlete, you might be able to do some explosive pull-ups. Um, sometimes these are called McGill pull-ups. Again, I'm just trying to throw out all these terms for you. So if you're unsure what I'm talking about, you can go and Google this. Um, but it's really just moving, pulling yourself towards that bar uh, that you're holding onto as quickly as possible or muscle-ups are an option too. you got to move pretty quickly to actually get yourself all the way up for that muscle-up. Those are all explosive options. A lot of athletes just aren't strong enough though. And again, if you have that anchor point, band pulls um, are, are a great option. Probably have to do single arm uh, here, but then you can pull and rotate as fast as possible. So similar to the press, but uh, you're doing that pulling motion again teaches you to coordinate your arms and your core as well. Okay, and then that last dynamic need I was talking about that I, I think would probably be vital for strength training for your sport would be um, that kind of core rotational piece. So it's not just about moving your arms, but you got to coordinate that core and you got to be powerful within your core. And there's, there's core movement involved um, in your sport as well. So we'll go through that same process, hypertrophy, core rotation options. So this is a, our, we've got a little bit of volume, six plus reps, 15 plus seconds to near failure. And planks and incline planks, again, incline, decline, however you think about it, just like the push-up to make it easier or harder. And then as they get better, you can start to introduce movement, lift an arm, lift a leg, tap a shoulder, something like that. Uh, those are all good options for creating movement, which means that uh, our core then has to stabilize against that movement, prevent that movement, resist that movement. So uh, creating instability there. Planks are great options. Same thing with their side planks, just tackles it again from a slightly different uh, angle. Uh, but make sure, again, some people aren't strong enough to actually do a plank for very long, a side plank for very long, and be tucking a knee or, or uh, creating some kind of movement. So making sure whatever you're doing, you're making it uh, easy enough that you can do enough volume, but not too easy that they're not working hard. We can do our dead bugs here. That's nice uh, core training and, and it adds a bit of a kind of an alternating unilateral, ipsilateral kind of uh, movement to it. So our dead bugs, and if you're not sure what these are, dead bug, a pretty common exercise term. So you can Google that or YouTube that. Um, another thing you can try is a Sarman's test. Um, so it's, it's both a test uh, of core functionality or somebody's ability to brace and, and under various difficulty of loads, um, but it can also be a way to train. It's a bit of a progression into dead bugs. Um, so not going to get too into that, but again, that's a great way to start to train and, and see if they're actually turning on uh, those muscles or if they can maintain turning on those muscles and producing some force for longer periods of time um, under various loads. So you could Google Sarman's test. I'm pretty sure that's how you spell it, uh, but it's kind of like a dead bug series. Bird dogs, again, just um, kind of alternating uh, unilateral one side then the other um, exercise that's good for the core and starts to teach us how to, to rotate and, and manage rotation and resist rotation and all that kind of stuff. Paloff presses and holds again if you haven't heard of this term um, look that up it's a nice exercise where you're uh, holding a band again you need a band or a towel or a strap or something um, at a uh, or a pulley but in, in an anchor point, but then you're going to have that anchor um, off to the side somewhere from where you're standing. So it, it, it wants to pull you to the side, and then you either resist that movement or you pull against it if you're doing a press versus kind of a rotation versus a hold. Um, and then you can do that at various angles. You have the anchor point low. You can have it nice and high. So lots of options there. I really like the Paloff series. And then keeping in mind, I alluded to this earlier, band arm, uh, single arm band, presses and pulls they're also going to introduce a core component so uh, sometimes you're killing two birds with one stone or one exercise here it can be both your pushing and your pulling but also your core uh, rotation if you're doing single arm stuff for the max strength of the core uh, we have the same problem as all the other muscles and movements uh, it, it can be hard to find enough load but you do have your pal off options, so if you can find a way to load it appropriately, uh, you have your presses and your, your isometric um, pal off series there. You also have your single arm band presses and pulls and isometric variations of those. So if you can find a way to train um, max strength to produce max force, 
um, in these single arm or rotational types of movements or positions, that's a great way to train max strength. And then our power training for our core. So one to five reps, but not to near failure. Instead, doing it very explosively. Uh, Pile off presses again. Now you can't do your isometrics here because a because uh, you don't have any movement, but you can do it for power. So then you're going to rotate your hips uh, and pull. Sometimes these are called wood choppers. So again, another term. Um, throw it out there if you want to Google that or YouTube that. Um, sometimes they're called wood choppers, but the key is to do it explosively here. And then same thing with our pushes or our pulls, we want to rotate and explode. So we're really thinking about how to control our hips, create movement from our hips, coordinate that through our core rotation, and then transfer that force through to our arms. All right, getting close to the end here. So we'll talk about the nutrition. Um, I'll try to tie in a bit of that physiology at this start so we, we know... Um, how to train we've kind of put together a program we're navigating a few covid related barriers uh, and then nutrition is really going to help us get the most out of this so uh, last thing we'd want to do is is do all of this training and then not getting adaptation because we aren't um, supporting it enough with our nutrition so uh, let's talk about nutrition a little bit pre-training so you think back to that cell signaling and AMPK. AMPK is an energy sensor. So if we train too much, it will be elevated and it will blunt mTOR signaling. Uh, also, if we don't eat enough. It's one of the, the, the best ways to, to really um, put AMPK through the roof is to train fasted. There's no energy if you haven't been eating. And so AMP goes up and it blunts uh, mTOR. You can't get strong if you train fasted. So making sure that you are not only introducing a gap between training uh, so that you're not um, you're letting AMPK settle down from um, your conditioning before that or, or on water training or whatever it is um, or just previous training sessions but uh, you also want to make sure that you're going in well fed uh, that's going to make sure that uh, you've got lots of energy uh, and you're not going to be blunting this mTOR signaling in any way now, the thing you need to consider, it's not just about eating all the food all the time, is you need to think about digestion. If we're going to be eating right before training, last thing we want to do, you eat all this food, it's in your stomach. Uh, if it just ends up in the toilet, then or it just stays in your stomach because you can't digest it, that's not going to help get this energy to your muscles. So it not only need to eat the muscle or eat the, the food, you need to get the food to your muscles. So we need to think about digestion rates and met, uh, metabolic rates here. So our three nutrients, these are the nutrients that provide energy. So again, trying to get energy to the cell. Carbohydrates take less than two hours to digest. That's important to note. Protein's going to take about two to five hours, and then fats take about four to nine. So if you have a long time before your training session, you can go for the fats. But if you're talking one, two hours before training, I try to, you know, consider how much kind of fat and greasy food you're going to have. And then if you're right before 30 minutes, again, consider how much even protein you're going to have there. I like to use something called a 3-2-1 rule. So three hours before training, uh, you're looking to get a good amount of protein, a good amount of carbs, and then maybe a tiny little bit of fat here. At two hours, you're cutting out the fat, maybe a little bit less protein, and you're going to start to really focus on carbs here, and then one hour before, you're probably mostly going carbohydrates. Now again, this is a starting point. A lot of athletes can handle a bunch of protein right before training, and so that's okay. But it's a starting point. It gives you uh, conceptually at least the idea. As you approach training, you want to have relatively less fat, relatively less protein, and relatively more carbohydrates. Again, we have to get the food not only just into our stomach, but also actually into our muscles. Here's a novel idea. Uh, that's gaining a bit more traction. Uh, the idea of dietary collagen and for tendon health. So if you think of right back to the anatomy, those first couple slides, the muscle contracts, it shortens, and it has to pull on that tendon. For that tendon to transfer the force through to the bone and actually create movement, it has to be stiff enough. So we need some actual tendon strength for the force to transfer. If it's not strong enough, if it's not stiff enough, what ends up happening is that tendon stretches and it potentially gets damaged. Um, but 
even if it doesn't get damaged, it's not going to transfer that force through to movement. So we're not going to move as well if our tendons aren't nice and strong. So tendons are required to transfer the force we generate from our muscles. And tendons are made of collagen. So this is, this is where this dietary collagen idea comes in. So dietary collagen pre-training may provide the amino acids that are necessary to synthesis collagen. So again, collagen is made of, um, sorry, tendons are made of collagen and collagen is made of amino acids. So you are what you eat. If we eat a little bit of collagen, we get some of those amino acids. The idea would be um, we could potentially get those amino acids into the tendon so that it can uh, create more collagen within the tendon and make that tendon nice and strong. So just like muscle protein synthesis, uh, um, you know, building muscle hypertrophy, we can actually um, uh, build tendon strength too. So the idea would be a little bit of um, dietary collagen may help with that. Now the thing is, it's very new still and the efficacy is, is yet to be determined. So just throwing this out there so you're kind of aware, I'm not saying you have to do these things. Um, I would say that 3, 2, 1 and just getting enough energy uh, is probably priority number one, but it's something to think about here. Um, however, if we think about the risk reward, collagen is a protein and more protein doesn't hurt. So again, even if it doesn't um, necessarily help with tendon strength, in general, our athletes don't eat enough protein, so protein is good. Um, you also need vitamin C to, uh, to synthesize collagen. So often what I'll do is I'll get athletes to take their their collagen with dietary collagen with orange juice and vitamin C. Orange juice gives us carbohydrates. So again, if you think about your pre-workout, um, getting some carbohydrate probably doesn't hurt. Uh, but keep in mind, collagen be can, can be hard to digest. It's a protein, right? So it takes a little bit longer to digest. So I would I would trial it with um, with someone if you're going to do it or you're going to try to get an athlete to do it. Again, don't get them to do it right before a hard session. Um, if we're thinking down the road, it may not be the tool you use for hard on intense on water sessions, but generally with strength training, there's a little bit more breaks in there. You, you might be able to get away with, um, with a little bit of protein, a little bit of collagen. So something to, to think about, although again, it's going to be a little bit different for everyone. And then obviously you need to think about, um, uh, the sources, how you're all, how you're actually going to get it. Um, so food wise, gelatin, whether you're using those jello packs, Knox uh, kind of gelatin packs, or you're getting to eat jello and then drinking some vitamin C or something like that, eating an orange as well. Uh, that's potentially one way or using a certified supplement. Um, again, not going to go too far down the supplement safety uh, route, but, but make sure that you are um, supplementing in a safe way. And, and again, you're also supplementing with an athlete that's appropriate you know it, it might not make sense for an eight-year-old for you to get them to start taking a collagen supplement uh, but but supplements are potentially an option as well so if you want to look into this a little bit more uh, i would encourage you to look up someone keith barr he's doing some research in this area uh, not a lot of it is being done uh, causationally, at least is being done in uh, humans yet. A lot of it's still being done in engineered ligaments. So it, the, the um, quality of the evidence in terms of uh, being performance enhancing in humans is, is still a little limited. But uh, if you are interested in digging into this a little bit further, you can look into Keith Barr's work. So here's a few studies from him. Okay, so we've got our pre-training, we're going in, we've got this nice gap between training sessions, uh, So we and we have this nice well-designed strength training program, so we're going to get nice and strong, uh, we've got lots of energy, we've, we've, uh, we're have we've going in not fasted, you, you have a little, um, maybe a carb snap right before so that you've got lots of energy. So we've, we've put ourselves into the perfect situation to get nice and strong, then the last piece would be making sure we're recovering uh, from that. And so again, thinking back to the cell signaling, what are the two pieces that uh, nutrition pieces that activate mTOR? It's those protein or amino acids, arginine and leucine. So having some protein, um, and it's also getting that insulin response, and that's going to come from our carbohydrate.
And so we can use something called the three R's of recovery. Again, this is just a way to try to remember this. If, if you don't remember which R is which, it's, it's not a big deal. It's just a way to try to remember again. Um, it, three R's stand for refuel, rebuild, rehydrate. Refuel is getting our carbohydrates. Rebuild is getting our protein. And then rehydrate is getting our fluid. And again, fluid's not necessarily going to help us get strong per se, but hydration is important for related and unrelated reasons, so uh, it doesn't hurt to rehydrate and get some fluid as well. Usually athletes are thirsty after uh, after training anyway, so um, why not get some fluids? But again, getting your carbohydrates helps you um, get a bit of that insulin response, and getting your protein gets you those amino acids. These are all good for mTOR, strength adaptation, all that kind of stuff. So whether you remember three R's, refuel, rebuild, rehydrate, or you just remember carbs, proteins, fluids, getting a good recovery is going to be that last piece to really maximizing our strength training and recovery. Okay, so we're done. I know you're not uh, live, so you can't ask questions right now, but I believe the, uh, the idea is that I'm going to jump on a, a live virtual session with you at some point. So you review this, write down your questions. I know I went through a lot of different things there. And uh, I can do a quick summary again in a month or so or whenever we connect and then, um, and then we can do a good Q&A session when it's all done.